Praise the name of Lord Jesus Christ. It's good to see uh, familiar faces. It's good to see visitors. And uh, we always thank God for those of you who come to worship with us. And just by way of reminder, that's exactly what we are here to do today, to worship the Lord God Almighty, to worship the one who gave himself for our sins, that we might be reconciled to God the Father, to understand that there is, by way of the believer's great hope, great confidence in what Jesus Christ has accomplished for us. And so again, I greet you in the name of our dear Savior. I'd like to ask you to take your Bibles this morning, turn back once again, <clears throat> excuse me, to the book of Galatians. I just realized that some of you who have not seen uh, maybe in a year or so, the last time you were here, you were in Gal we were in Galatians as well. And uh, I don't think it's as bad as the one time when I was in the prison and I, had, I was preaching uh, through the book of Romans, taking surprisingly uh, a long time to get through it. And there was a man who had uh, been released from prison and in a, in a couple of years had been back. And I said, take your Bibles and open to the book of Romans. He said, that's where you were at the last, when I was here the last time. So I don't think we'll be here. We're almost done with Galatians. I don't say that with any kind of uh, excitement or wanting to get through the end of this book. This has been a, a blessed book. I hope uh, you have gained from it as, as much as I have. And what I hope, and what I hope to do here today is to present to you another one of these passages in this book of Galatians that are one of these standalone passages, uh, these passages that loom so large in the mind of the Christian, these passages that have very much a, a, an essential and fundamental uh, base for the whole Christian gospel. And so the passage I want to look at here today, <clears throat> excuse me, is Galatians chapter 6, verse 15. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 15, we read the following, for in, Christ Je for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creature. For in Christ Jesus, neither uncircumcision nor circumcision avails anything but a new creation. And what I want to do here today is I want to set before you this great theme of the gospel. That in and through the Lord Jesus Christ and by way of the operation of the Spirit of God upon your soul, when you were brought savingly to Jesus Christ, you became a new creature in Christ. When you came to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, all of your sins, all of their penalties, everything by way of what may press upon your conscience and your mind by way of guilt that was all washed away in the blood of Jesus Christ, this is a great reality of the Christian faith. And as I said before, it's one of these passages of Scripture that in a very real way stands apart, stands alone. You can pick up this passage of Scripture at any time and preach the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, do you remember last week we looked at another one of the passages uh, in the New Testament that are, that are very much of the same kind of class, we might say. That passage of Scripture, you remember, where the Apostle Paul says, God forbid that I should glory or boast, save in the cross of Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. And in that passage of Scripture, the Apostle Paul was setting all of his hopes on the cross of Jesus Christ. Well, what I want to do here this morning is I want to take a look just at this one passage, verse 15. I hope to develop it for you in a way that sufficiently brings out an understanding of what the new birth is. I hope and I pray that uh, by the end of this sermon, uh, you will understand what it means to be a new creature in Christ, a new creation, uh, what our Lord Jesus Christ refers to as being born again. hope to be able to set that before you. I also hope to show you here this morning how that this reality of being a new creature in Christ is bound up in Christ alone. The Apostle Paul says, for in Christ Jesus, it's only in Christ that this great blessing comes to you. It's only in Christ that the soul is eternally secure. It's only in Christ that you can have this confidence that no matter what your past may have been, it's all washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. And then I hope to, to further uh, open up this passage of Scripture in order to show you that what we see the Apostle Paul emphasizing is that this reality, this blessedness of being in Christ, and this blessedness, again, of being a new creature, a, a new creature is not, does not come to us by way of any type of religious ritual or observance. This was the great tension uh, in Galatia. You remember in the first century there, uh, there were those uh, individuals who were coming to the church or to the churches and saying, remember, unless you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. And that was the great point of contention. And that was a great, uh, 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 again, point of tension uh, for uh, the Apostle Paul as he was trying to keep pure the gospel in Galatia and as he was trying again to, to shepherd and to secure uh, those dear saints of God there in Galatia. 
one of the things that we're going to do uh, in working out this outline. I want to, and we'll probably do this in the introduction, so we'll probably be here in a few minutes. One of the things I want to do is I want to engage the idea, when is, the, when is it right and proper for the Christian to stand boldly as the Apostle Paul did in Galatians chapter 1 and even in Galatians chapter 2? And when is it right for the Christian to be more accommodating as we see him in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 22 and 23. You remember when the apostle says, I've become all things to all men that I might win some. So how do we as believers today navigate that? And what we're going to see is that the essential point in both of the passages of scripture, the essential point is the primacy of the purity of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I hope to be able to uh, do some work in that, in that regard. And then lastly, what I want to do here today is I want to set before you, I want to press upon your consciences that everything that we are speaking by way of the new birth is a necessity for you. Jesus says, you must be born again. Paul says again, only in Christ is there this new creature. And so I want to press upon you again the necessity of this spiritual work that only the Spirit of God can, can uh, complete upon your soul. No religion, no ritual, no outward morality, only a genuine work of God upon the soul. But that's what God does. He works in the soul. He saves sinners. We're going to see again a number of examples from the from, from Scripture. We're going to see there was that there was old uh, hated Matthew there to, uh, collecting his taxes, and the, and the Lord Jesus Christ comes when this man gets saved, and there he was now the faithful apostle. We're going to see a number of examples along these lines. So with all that in mind, then here today, what I want to do is I, once again I want to work through this passage of Scripture. Allow me uh, a moment of review from uh, last week. You remember when we looked at uh, 614, uh, one of the things that we said, we saw two things. Number one, in 614, when the Apostle Paul says, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of Jesus Christ, our Lord, uh, by whom, the world, is, uh, by whom the, the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. You remember we, we saw in that passage of Scripture the ability to discern the true gospel, true Christianity from false Christianity. And I don't know last week, if for those of you that were here, I don't know if that was uh, a little too uh, bold or a little too forward in my uh, presenting that. And the reason why I did it is because I'm convinced that this is exactly what Paul was doing in that passage of Scripture. In verses 11 through 14, what he is doing is he is kind of closing out, well actually verses 11 to the end of the chapter, he's closing out this epistle to the Galatians, and one of the things that he's doing is he's going over primary points. And he's touching upon the whole matter of circumcision. And there in that 11th verse, he says along these lines, he says, you know, for as many as want to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be, to be circumcised. And, and they, at the end of the day, what are they hoping for? They want to glory in your flesh. And Paul says again, God forbid that I should glory, saving the cross of Jesus Christ. And so what we see here is that true Christianity will glory only in the cross of Jesus Christ. The true Christianity will now will allow nothing to take that place upon which the cross stands. The true Christianity understands that there is only one way that God has given for the salvation of sinners, but oh, any sinner may come to that one way. And where we see, but in contrast, what does false Christianity do? Well, false Christianity wants to make a fair show in the flesh. You remember there in verse 11. False Christianity, what else does it want to do? It wants to avoid unnecessary persecution for the cross of Christ. They compel you to be circumcised. Why? Only lest they should suffer persecution for the cause of Christ. False Christianity is always looking to avoid that persecution that will necessarily come. Now, I gave this caveat last week. I'll give it again. Should you and I in our day face persecution, there's nothing wrong with us fleeing persecution so long as we don't surrender any vital principle of the gospel. You don't need to, to stand in a, in, in a place where Christ is not calling you to stand. If persecution comes, it's, it's proper and right to flee. Jesus says the same thing. But there are those, and false Christianity is marked by this, it'll, it'll mute the, the, exclusive, the exclusivity of the message of the gospel in order to avoid persecution for the cause of Christ. It will present religion rather than true Christianity in order to avoid persecution for the cause of Christ. And the next thing you might remember that we saw about, uh, about uh, false uh, Christianity, and again, I want to emphasize this. I, 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 I emphasize false Christianity, not false religion. I said false Christianity. 
And one of the things that we saw about false Christianity, and again, we're, we're a little sensitive to this because we're all prone to what I'm about to say, false Christianity is essentially hypocritical. For neither, for neither they who are circumcised keep the law. And again, one of the things that we see about false Christianity, again, it's this hypocrisy that underlies it. That, that assertion then should cause us to come before God with all humility of heart and ask him to, to make us true and, and honest and sincere believers. I'm not Christians again in name only. I'm not Christians again just because it's a, maybe, a, maybe the way that we've been brought up or maybe it's a, a, it's a, it's a convenient uh, thing for us by way of our social setting. No, that there is a real union of our souls with Christ. And so again, that's what we saw last week uh, by, way of, uh, by way of that passage of Scripture. And then Paul coming to that great, that great emphasis, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, how the Christian thanks God for Jesus Christ and for the cross. Well, again, what we're going to do here this morning, if you look again at verse 15, you're going to see really within the context, Paul is explaining now the reason for his boast. For, that's what that little conjunction is there for. He's explaining the very reason why he has such confidence in the cross of Christ. Why should this man, Paul, who had so much to be able to boast about by way of his own accomplishments uh, in, in, in Judaism, in religion, why should this man take this exclusive stand on the cross of Jesus Christ? Because he says very clearly, for in Christ Jesus, again, that's the only thing that avails for salvation. It is kind of interesting because Paul is going to use this expression, uh, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. That word avail basically means to have the, uh, basically means to have the power to accomplish. In other words, nothing can accomplish salvation other than the cross of Jesus Christ. But what's interesting is that phrase, uh, again, for neither circumcision or uncircumcision avails anything. This is the second time that Paul has used that expression in Galatians. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, he says it this way, For neither circumcision or uncircumcision avails anything but faith working by love. And so again, what he's talking about even in that passage, he's talking about a real, true, genuine, saving experience that is brought that brings the soul in, in, in connection with the saving purposes of God by faith alone, but gives expression of that faith in love. And so again, the Apostle Paul well, as I said before, what we're going to see and what we're seeing in these two passages is, the, the, if I can say it this way, it's, it's the stern Apostle Paul. It's Paul, again, taking a stand upon the cross and on the gospel. And it leads us to, to ask ourselves the question when we see Paul saying these very strident things, how do we understand uh, exactly why Paul is so, uh, is so insistent in a place like this and then in other places, we see the Apostle Paul very amenable to uh, uh, an approach uh, to those who may disagree with him in such a way as to not be overbearing, in such a way as to allow, uh, as, as to allow, allow almost, uh, I'll say it this way, almost a certain amount of latitude. Uh, when is it when the Apostle Paul sees it right to, to express to a fellow believer that there is a certain liberty in Christ and there, is, there are certain things, again, that do not rise to the level of having to defend with all kind of uh, insistence. How do we understand uh, when to draw these lines? Well, the first thing that I would say to you is this, that no matter, how, no matter what of these two points we are talking about, the issue always comes back to the gospel. So I'm going to ask you to do some turning in your Bible here right now. So if you just turn back a few pages and go to Galatians chapter 1, verses uh, 6 through 9, you remember this is the passage of scripture that really sets the tone uh, for the entire uh, epistle to the Galatians. And you remember in that passage of scripture, some, some commentators, I, I think it was, uh, I think it was uh, J. Vernon McGee in his, own kind of, uh, in his own kind of style and way said something like this, that the apostle Paul has his war paint on uh, when he comes to this passage of scripture. And here's that passage of scripture again, where the apostle Paul says, uh, if anyone preaches any other gospel than that which you have received, let him be a cursed. He says, I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel than that which you have received, again, let him be a curse. And so Paul is taking this, this very firm stand on the purity of the gospel. He will, not, he will allow no deviation from it. Go also, just again, turn to chapter 2. I believe it's chapter 2, verse 5. And Paul talks about some of the, some of the conflict that he had with, 
uh, with other believers, even other apostles. And in, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 5, look what Paul says there. Again, he's very strident at this point. Chapter 2, verse 5, uh, and, and, and actually we could start with verse 4. And because of false brethren unawares brought in, which came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us in the bondage to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But the, verse 6, but those who seem to be somewhat, whosoever they are, and make it no matter to me, God accepts no man's person. For, who, for, for they who seem to be somewhat in confidence added nothing to me. Paul, again, you see, is very strident at this point. And so I would say this to you. When it comes to these matters of protecting the purity of the gospel, the Christian must be unmovable. The Christian must be unshakable. And I say this to, to, to men here that, that they have responsibility before God to preach the gospel. Men, we must stand on the truth of the gospel. Come whatever opposition may come our way. If I can say it this way, God's not called us to be, to be voted most popular. A lot of times that's just not going to happen. But here is the Apostle Paul again. And what is he doing? He's standing for the, for the purity and for the, and for the clarity of the gospel. But we also know that there are other passages, right? And probably the most famous is that passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. You can turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 22 and 23, where the Apostle Paul very readily and very easily is able to say that I've become, to the Jew I became as a Jew, to the Gentiles I became as a Gentile. Why? That, that, I, that, that, that by some means I, I may be able to, uh, to win some to Christ. And let me get to that passage of Scripture myself. Uh, so 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9. Verse 22, again, very, a very well-known passage of Scripture. I hate to say this, a, a passage of Scripture that sometimes is, 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 is a woefully misapplied. Uh, sometimes uh, this passage of Scripture is used uh, to step away from some of, the, some of the pushback that may come on preaching the exclusive gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, sometimes, uh, I hate to say it this way, sometimes uh, uh, this, this passage, I'm going to be very, very careful here, Sometimes this passage has, as I said, been misused, sometimes even used as a, as a refuge for, for those who do not want to suffer persecution for the cause of Christ. But again, if you look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 22 and following, uh, or verses 22 and 23, Paul says this, To the weak I became as weak that I might, get, that I, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And I do this for the gospel's sake that I might be a partaker thereof with you. I do this for the gospel's sake. Let me say this. So long as you understand and can fully, I don't know, how, so long as you understand and, and know the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and know what it, it, what, it, what it emphasizes by way of the exclusivity of salvation through faith alone in Christ alone, so long as you know that and understand that and so long as you will not be moved off of that and so long as there is no challenge being presented to that, then we can, we can, we can address individuals or, or come in contact with them the, the way that Paul is doing here. The issue in both cases is the purity of the gospel. I do all these things for the gospel's sake. And so I hope that is somewhat helpful, that when we come to these decisions as how to, how to approach, how to engage, we must first and foremost understand that the exclusivity of the gospel calls us to stand with Christ and for Christ, even in a hostile setting or situation. But there are also, again, those situations that are not impacting the essence of the gospel. In those cases, we can be all things to all men that we might win some. Is that helpful to you? I hope and I pray that it is. I hope and I pray it will help you navigate uh, some of these things that we come in contact with. And the reason why I'm doing this is because Paul is very clearly being emphatic to say that there is only one way to be saved. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of Jesus Christ. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails for anything but a new creature. And so having laid all that out before you then, what I want to do in this passage of Scripture, I want to set before you our primary proposition, the proposition that I will work through here today. And that is that every, every, every one of us here must be a new creature in Christ. Every one of us here must be the recipient of the new birth. Every one of us here must, in the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, be born again. And even before I go on in this sermon here today, I ask you, are you born again?
Have you come to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you seen your sin in light of the holiness of God? And have you understood the holiness of God through the perspective of his saving mercy on the cross? This is the gospel. This is what brings the soul in the contact with Christ. Let me say it this way. It is upon the preaching of the true gospel that the spirit of God operates upon the soul, working within you this faith in Christ. Why is the gospel preached? And why should the gospel never be watered down? Because the gospel is the very means that God uses to create faith within the sinner. The spirit of God operating alongside him. Who knows? What is it? What is it about this gospel when we hear it being preached? And when the spirit of God is operating in the soul, that the soul is drawn out to Christ. I was looking for a hymn here uh, to, today. I, I was going to read it through, and it's in our, I'm surprised in our new hymn book it's not there. It's, a, it's an old hymn by John Newton, and, 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 and the title is, uh, or the, the first line, it goes something like this. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. Doesn't the name of Jesus sound sweet to you? What is it? What is it about this mention of Christ that draws the soul? And so again, all this, that's what this new birth is. This new birth is the effect of the Spirit of God upon the soul, drawing the heart to Christ. Does that describe you here this morning? I hope and I pray that it does. I hope and I pray that whatever temptations this world presents to you, and temptations many it presents, I hope and I pray that nothing is sweeter to you than Christ and the mention of Christ. And so again, as, I, as we work through this proposition, in shorthand, you must be born again. I want to I work through uh, four points in my outline today rather than three. Uh, four points, and, and the points will be as follows. Number one, we're going to take a look at the new creation and ask the question, what is it? What is the new creation? I've already described it here a little bit. We'll go into a little more detail. Secondly, we're going to take a look at the new creation and, ask, and, and, and make the affirmation, make the assertion that the new creation is found only in Christ. For, again, for, for in Christ, neither. It's only in Christ. Third thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the new creation, and we're going to see how that it, is, it is presented in the Scripture as coming to us uh, certainly apart from circumcision, and then by way of implication, apart from any type of religious ritual. I'm going to use a little phrase today that might be somewhat new to you, and what I hope to explain in a little bit is I want you to understand that when we look at the, the wonder and the, and, the, and the grace of salvation presented to us on the scripture, I, w I want you to understand that the gospel is first and foremost evangelical before it is sacramental. What do I mean by that and why am I getting into that? There are views of Christianity in our day that see salvation as sacramental. In other words, it's through a system of sacraments that your soul is brought into union with Jesus Christ. The sacrament conferred brings the blessing of the gospel. And I want you to understand that the, that the testimony of Scripture is, is unanimous, that salvation is evangelical. And when I say evangelical, I don't mean a particular uh, segment of, of Protestant Christianity. I don't mean that at all. I mean that when the gospel is preached, the sinner hears the promise of God in the gospel. And the way that the sinner is saved is by throwing, looking, calling, leaning, resting upon Christ and Christ alone. Now, will the working out of the Christian faith involve certain Christian ordinances that Jesus Christ has, has, has given to his church? Most certainly it will. We must follow Christ in water baptism. We will see again by way of our participation in the Lord's Supper, the Lord Jesus Christ himself nourishes our souls. And so while there is a, what we might say, is, uh, and I, my preference is for the word ordinance, while there are ordinances that Christ has given to the church, salvation is evangelical. You are not saved, as, as Paul was arguing in his day, none were saved by way of circumcision, so none are saved today by way of ritual. But there will be an expression of your faith in baptism. There will be an expression of your faith in coming to the Lord's Supper. We understand all those things. But again, that's what I hope to show here today, that, uh, that the new creation is apart from circumcision or ritual. And then the last point of my outline is that the new creation, it is the one essential thing for you. I come back again to the original assertion, are you born again? Well, let's take a look then at each of these points in our outline. The first thing I want to 
kind of work with you is to give you something of an understanding of what the new creation is. Now, it's interesting, again, the new creation is a supernatural work of God upon the soul, whereby we who were once in Adam, we who were born in sin, we who lived our lives previous to coming to faith in Christ, uh, really, uh, again, uh, uh, prioritized everything by our, by our way of our own desires and our own longings. We had, if, if any, we had uh, uh, either we had no thought about God or only a, a secondary thought about God. Maybe we had that kind of thought about God that if we got caught doing this, we'd be in big, big trouble, and that we would hope, again, that uh, if, uh, if, if I had to die at any time. I hope I'm not dying right now because right now I know I'm in sin. And that may have been the extent of somebody thinking about God. But I want you to, again, to know and to understand that the new birth, this new creation, is a supernatural work of God upon the soul. Again, it takes place through the preaching of the gospel. Sometimes that preaching of the gospel is very formal, kind of like in what we're happening today. Other times that preaching of the gospel is very informal. There, your friend maybe was with you, and, and maybe your friend was explaining and talking about Jesus Christ and talking about the forgiveness of sins and talking about the, what the Word of God has to say. And maybe immediately or maybe over a process of time, you began to realize that all these things that the Bible say uh, that concerning sinners are true about you. But you also understood that everything that the Bible says by way of God mercy and grace was open to you and you said again in, in, in your own mind and in your own way but it was the operation of the spirit of God within you you may not have been aware of it but there you were again coming to this to this realization this 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 awareness this understanding that yes Jesus Christ died for me and if I will but look to Jesus Christ I will by the promise of God be saved Amen. and I say to you has that happened for each and every one of us here I hope and I pray that it has that it has and so this is the new birth. Again, it's a wonderful operation of the Spirit of God upon the hearing of the promise of God in the gospel. Again, this is what Jesus is talking about in John chapter 3, isn't it? Nicodemus comes, and Nicodemus, that, that very significant religious man, and, and what does Jesus say to him? Except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. That was actually the passage of scripture that I came to faith in Christ uh, uh, with. And that passage of scripture, John 3, verses 3 through 5. And I remember in my own very simplistic way, thinking to myself, well, I guess if Jesus says you've got to be born again, I guess you've got to be born again. He's kind of running the show, isn't he? Yeah. And so, <laughs> so, so nothing, no, nothing too involved. And so, and it wasn't immediately, I think I've said this to you, some of you in the past before, I can remember at times in that whole time that God was working on my soul, I, can, I was in the Navy at the time, I can, remember it, I, I can remember going to bed in tears, going to my bunk in tears, and yet not having repented of sin and come to faith in Jesus Christ. But thank God in his mercy, thank God in his kindness, thank God in his patience. Uh, he dealt with his soul. He'll deal with your soul as well. And so what you're seeing here again, and what is the new birth? It's that which Jesus Christ talks about there in John chapter 3. It's the new birth. It's the new creation. Now what's interesting is that the idea of newness is very, very important to the whole, uh, to the whole uh, structure of the New Testament. I'm going to say that again. The idea of newness is very essential to the whole structure of New Testament Christianity. Now, what's interesting is that the idea of newness is not some kind of imposition on what God has revealed throughout history, but rather embedded in even the Old Testament promises that looking forward to a new day is something that we see. I think one of the, one of the ways that we see this structurally is that great promise that God gave to Moses in Deuteronomy 18 where God said that he would raise up a prophet like unto Moses, and that prophet would be the one that all must listen to. Well, that prophet, again, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm saying this because I want you to understand that, that this forward-looking to that new time when Messiah would come is, again, embedded even in the Old Testament scriptures. We think of other passages of scripture as well that had a forward look to a coming glorious day. Uh, there, again, is Rick read in Ezekiel chapter 36. That's beautiful. The whole ministry of the Spirit of God. As a matter of fact, John chapter 3, in a very real way, is, is, is Jesus' application of Ezekiel uh, 36. The same thing in Jeremiah 31, where there's a great promise of the new covenant. So the idea of newness is not something that is like, that, that is like uh, imposed upon the revelation that God has given, but the idea of newness is that which develops within uh, the Old Testament revelation and comes to a flower in the person of Christ. This flowering in the person of Christ comes about as we read the preaching of the gospel, especially in the book of Acts. 
the preachers in the book of Acts, whether the formal preachers of the book of Acts or whether those who are just, you know, talking about the gospel, there are, there are a number of themes that are always present. This idea that Jesus is the, a descendant of David, this idea that God is raising up a, a son to sit on David's throne, uh, this idea that uh, there would be the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, this idea that Jesus Christ is, is coming again to judge the living and the dead, to rule and to reign on earth, these things become the pattern of so much of preaching in the New Testament. And as I said before, these are all part and parcel of this newness that's established in uh, the, in the New Testament. Stop and think of how many times the word new is used with many of our familiar ideas of New Testament Christianity. There's the new birth. There's new life. There's the new covenant. There's the new name that's given to you. There's a new song that we will sing in heaven. There's our Lord Jesus Christ who says, I make all things new. This idea then of newness is, is part and parcel of what the gospel is all about. And so when we talk about the new birth, understand that it is that which the Spirit of God works upon the soul, but it is also that which was spoken of in the Old Testament and now finds its flowering in the person of Jesus Christ. And I come back to my, to my application, of my, my, my applicatory question. Are you that new creature in Christ? Do you know that newness? Do you know what it is that I have what Paul says in 2 Corinthians? Again, Rick read it this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's yours, you see. That's the promise to you. That's the promise to each and every one of us. And so that's what the new creation is. Now I want you to see also from this passage of Scripture that the new creation is found only in Christ. Paul was absolutely insistent on this. He will not move from this. In other situations, in other, for other, uh, uh, other applications, he can become all things to all men. He will prioritize the gospel in doing that, but he will become all things to all men. He will not in any way sacrifice any essential truth of the gospel, but he will become all things to all men. But when it comes to the gospel itself, Paul will not stand to be moved in any way. Again, Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. Galatians chapter 2, verse 5. This insistence on the purity of the gospel. And when, and when I say that the, that the uh, new creation is, only, is found only in Christ, I'm saying that because what Paul is saying, for in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. You see, here's the, the sphere in which salvation takes place. So salvation takes place in Christ we can talk here now about how that every person, every man, woman, boy, or girl is born into this world. As Paul makes the statement there in Romans chapter 5, born in Adam. But by way of the new birth, you're in Christ. And being in Christ, you have all those things that God has promised in salvation through Christ. You are now accepted, not because of ritual or circumstances, and you are accept, accepted in the Beloved. And so again, this, this idea now then of, uh, of the new creation is found only in Christ. This brings us to a very important theological category, and be patient with me here as I, as I develop this a little bit. And, and that is, we, you've heard this before because I've mentioned this to you before. This brings us to a very important uh, uh, doctrinal category, which is, re, which is known as the believer's union with Christ. Union with Christ. And if I can give just something of a picture of what union with Christ is, union with Christ is something like a hub in the center of a spoked wheel, and everything that flows, everything by way of salvation flows out from that hub. Are you here justified by faith alone in Christ alone is because you're united to Christ? Are you here having been definitively sanctified by the work of the Spirit setting you apart and now continually sanctified again by His continual operation in your soul? It's because you're united to Christ. Do you hope one day, again, at the end of your life to be glorified in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ when you no longer have to deal with all the residual aspects of sin and temptation of this world? It's all because you're united in Christ. And so union with Christ is a very, very important principle, very, very important doctrinal center uh, in the Word of God. How important is this doctrinal center, this point of union with Christ? Again, to reference John Newton, the old hymn writer. And let me say this, John, John Newton was much more than just a hymn writer. Um, his readings can be read with much profit. John Newton, uh, in, in his collected works, 
uh, some of his correspondence is, is found. And he wrote a letter to a, to a gentleman. I think it was a man. Sometimes he's writing to women, sometimes he's writing to men. And he's writing to the individual, and he comes on this point of union with Christ. And listen to what he says about union with Christ. He says the following. He says, he says the union of the believer with Christ is so intimate, so unalterable, so rich in privilege, so powerful in influence, that it cannot be fully represented by any description or similitude taken from any earthly things. He says the mind, like the sight, is incapable of apprehending a great object without viewing it on different sides. To help our weakness, the nature of this union is illustrated in Scripture by four comparisons, each throwing additional light on the subject, yet all falling short of the things signified. Do you understand how he's trying to really uh, elevate in our thinking of the wonder and the beauty of our union with Christ? And what he is pointing to when he says the Scripture makes uh, refer various references, these four references, He's talking about the fact that in the scripture, union with Christ is sometimes presented, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 2, I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 5 refers to the Christian and, and Christ and the church and Christ as being living stones built up into this, this holy edifice. And so as a, as a, as a, as a building is, is one, component parts coming together as this building is one. So that pictures in some degree our union with Christ. But if I can say it this way, and I think this is what we see in the development, and if I can say it, an, an inorganic picture of union with Christ is not sufficient. It's helpful, but it's not sufficient. And so the next picture of our union with Christ is an organic union, a living union. And we see this in, the, in, in our words teaching in the, in, 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 the, uh, in, in the vine and the branches. We are united to Christ as the branches to the vine. And you have everything by way of, an, by, 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 by way of life being conveyed there. But even that's really not enough. Because we have the, the, the image elevated even more. And we have the image in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, of verse 13, where we have Christ as the head and we are members of his body. And so again, we not only have an we not only have an inanimate, then we have an organic, then we have well, then we have a living a, 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 a soul, so to speak, a picture of what it means to be united to Christ. And even there, I think there's an advance. And that advance comes to us in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 31 and 32, when the Apostle Paul uses the image of marriage. As that, as that, as that image of the of the union of Christ with, uh, of Christ with the believer, and so now we've gone from inanimate to animate to, uh, to, to 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 life, now to love. This union with Christ, you see. This 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 attachment of the soul to Jesus Christ, this work of the Spirit of God uniting us savingly to Christ. You see again, Paul is is insistent. Of what? That it's only in Christ. For in Christ neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails any. Well, that brings me to my next point then. That the new creation is apart from any, from any, from any, uh, the, new, the new creation is apart from circumcision. And I would explicitly apart from circumcision. And I would say also uh, by way of implication from any, uh, from any religious ritual. Now again, we know that Paul has been arguing against those who were making a case uh, in order to be saved, you had to not only believe in Christ, you had to be circumcised as well. And again, this is one of the false marks of Christianity. There's always a, there's always an unless ye, there's always an, ex, there's always something that has to be added on to what Christ is doing. Because again, as I said before, Paul will have none of it. All the way through this, uh, all, the, all the way through this, uh, this epistle, again, Paul is emphasizing it. Just like I said uh, uh, a little bit earlier, Galatians chapter five, verse six: For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith. You see, faith unites the soul to Christ. Go to, go to Galatians chapter 3, verses, uh, I think, verses 26 and, and 28, and you'll see this great emphasis, again, on faith. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says here in Galatians chapter 3, uh, verses 26 um, uh, through, through well, we, can, we can stop at 29. Paul writes the following, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. There it is. You are the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. You're not the children of God by way of circumcision. You're not the children of God by way of ritual. But it's a beautiful thing to see here. Because notice again what we see in verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. This is very interesting. 
Because the emphasis here is not so much on the ritual of baptism, although the ritual of baptism should always accompany true saving faith. The emphasis in this passage of scripture is on that work of the Holy Spirit who baptizes us into the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. For by one spirit are you all, are you all baptized into one body. This baptizing work is a work of the Spirit. Remember when we said what the, what the new creation is? It's a work of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God unites us to Christ. He baptizes us in to the body of Christ. And again, verse 28, For there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ. Again, union. And if ye be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What are we seeing here? Paul is specifically laying out the reality of a saving experience apart from circumcision. And I would even say, by way of implication, we must say apart from even, uh, even Christian ritual as well. How do we say this then when it comes to baptism? Well, please understand what baptism is and what baptism is not. I get back to the point I made earlier. Salvation is evangelical before it's sacramental. And when you are presented with a view of the Christian gospel that is primarily sacramental, and that is saying to you that it is through your participation in the sacraments that grace is dispensed to you, and through that you come into a saving union with God, understand that it's, going, it's running afoul of what the scriptures teach. Now again, we are not at all making a case that we do not follow Christ. We observe the ordinances that Christ gave, but we understand them in their right and proper place. You remember there in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 8, an individual by the, man, uh, by the name of uh, Simon uh, uh, Magus, Magnus, I believe it is. And you remember that man saw the preaching of the gospel and he was very much taken up with it. <clears throat> you remember Simon, he was some great one. He, he again had kind of reputation and fame among the people. And he saw the gospel being preached. And he saw the pouring out of the Spirit of God. And he realized that by the laying on of hands, the Spirit of God was given. And again, he asked that he might participate in this in order that he too would have that same power. Simon is the example of a man who thinks that if I only become a Christian, my life can be better. I can be better at what I do. He wanted that same power. And you remember what Peter says? And the Bible says that he believed. I believe it's an example of spurious faith in the Scripture. The Bible says that he believed and he was baptized. And then again, when he, when he makes this request that, that by him, the laying on of hands, that through him, the laying on of hands, the spirit might also be given. What, the, what does Peter say? I perceive you're still in the, in, in the gall of iniquity. You know nothing of this saving work. What am I trying to say? The external right was applied, but there was no true saving faith. You and I are children of God through faith in Jesus Christ and faith in Jesus Christ alone, which is then accompanied by observing the ordinances that Christ has given. I'll say it again. The gospel is first evangelical before it's sacramental. And so again, we see that this is the, the emphasis that Paul is making. The next thing that I want you to see here then is that the new creation is the one essential thing for you. The new creation is the one essential thing for you. As I've said repeatedly, I hope and I pray that each and every one of us know the gospel of Jesus Christ. I hope we know what it is to have the work of the Spirit of God upon our hearts and souls. I hope and I pray that, again, that, uh, that, uh, that, that the name of Christ being presented to you over and over again is that which appeals to your soul. And I want you to see, again, uh, that as our Lord Jesus Christ says, ye must be born again. The only thing that matters by way of your eternal soul is that you are in Christ Jesus, and that you are in Christ Jesus and depending upon him and him alone. This is what you need. This is what I need. This is what every sinner needs, and every sinner has the opportunity to hear this blessed promise that all who look to, all who look to God through Jesus Christ in faith shall be saved. Another passage, again, I've already mentioned it, but I want to come back to it, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. For if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. He is a new creature. A new, a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. If any man be in Christ, this is the beauty of the gospel. It goes far and wide. It goes to every sinner. You don't have to qualify in a certain way to hear the gospel. You're already qualified because you're a sinner. <laughs> you may not want to hear that, but that's the reality of the matter. <laughs> And because of that, you must understand that Jesus Christ has come into the world to save sinners. But if any man, 
If any person, any boy, any girl, any adult, any woman, any man, hear the gospel and come to the Lord Jesus Christ, again, anyone in Christ is a new, cre a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things become new. I want you to think of that. Old things are passed away. We know what our, or we know what our consciences do to us, don't we? We know the sins concerning ourselves that probably no one else knows, but only God knows. We know that, don't we? Isn't it strange that we can still be embarrassed, we can still be embarrassed in our adult years, in our, in our 50s and 60s of things that we did, maybe in our teens, and yet we still know that because we've come to faith in Jesus Christ, those sins are forgiven, but they still affl afflict the mind, don't they? But I want you to know, I want you to hear, I want you to understand, that if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature, all things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. I made mention earlier of these old things that are passed away. And do you remember, as I said, there was, uh, there, there, there was, uh, there was hated Matthew there at the, at the, at the tax collector's uh, booth, uh, getting, it, getting his share, uh, squeezing out of you every, every nickel that he could. And again, you know how, the, how hated the tax collectors were uh, in that day. And again, this tax collector, again, what happens? He hears the gospel. He hears Christ call him. Christ called that man. I'm saying to you, for you here or here today, Christ is calling you. And you say, well, how do you know Christ has called you? Because he calls sinners. Unless you think you're here as not as a sinner, then and so Christ is calling you. There again was that was that was that was that was that woman that taken in adultery. And, and there she was, again, uh, ready to be stoned. And, and there she was. She was she was confronted by Christ, and there Christ came to her. And this woman now, who again was taken in the very act of adultery, think of the shame, think of the embarrassment, think of the think of how frightening it would be knowing that she was about to be stoned. And she meets Jesus Christ. And she becomes a virtuous woman. She becomes a holy woman. You say, Well, how do you know that she became a virtuous and holy woman? I guarantee you the Spirit of God would not put her on pages of Scripture if she had not lived according to what Christ called her to live. Christ changed this woman, you see. There was that blasphemer and that murderer, Saul of Tarsus. And he meets Jesus Christ on the, on the way to Damascus. And what happens? That man becomes the, becomes the mighty apostle Paul. There was that degenerate crew now, there in, in Corinth. You know the passage, 1 Corinthians 6. How many times I've referenced it in my sermons. You know the passage. And again, what happened to that degenerate crew? They became regenerate. And they became new creatures in Christ. I'm saying to you, you need this new creation. You need this new birth. And this new birth then is found in Christ Jesus. This new birth, this new creation is thorough. Your mind and your will and your affections will all be now directed toward Christ. You will have to fight many things intruding. But the drift of your soul will now be toward Christ and to his glory. Things will undermine you and things will trip you up and things will distract you and all of that. But, you're, but when you come back, if I can say it this way, when you come back to your right mind, it's oriented toward Jesus Christ. And why is that? Because the new creation is thorough. The mind, the will, and the affections. And so I ask you then the question again, are you that new creation? And you might be saying, I, listen, you don't know who I am. God knows who you are. You might say, well, you don't know the thing. Like, God knows all this. And you might say this. And you might say, look, listen, so, so let me put an end to it all. Let me give you the words of our Lord Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 25, verse 1. Uh, 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 Behold, I make all things new, Jesus says. And then he goes on to say, right, for these sayings are faithful and true. It's Jesus Christ who makes you new. Not the preacher, not, 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 not ceremony, not ritual. It's Jesus Christ himself. And so again, this you see why Paul is so insistent. You see why this passage of scripture can be, can be preached, lifting it out of, the, of, of its context in the, in the book of Galatians, and it can be preached in a wonderful way. Well, now we come to our applications then, don't we? How do we apply such a wonderful passage of scripture as this? And first of all, let me say this. Let us look to Christ and nothing, and let, let us look to Christ and let nothing of your past hinder you from coming to Christ. Remember the words of Jesus? Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That word is still being spoken. That word still 
appeals to the soul. Come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. To those of you, to those of us who are here, and we know we're united to Christ. We know we've been saved. We're not looking to anything else to save us other than Christ and Christ alone. But you may be here in a very low spiritual state. Your, your soul may be somewhat downcast. The circumstances of life may be overwhelming you. Maybe even worse, you're here this morning having freshly sinned last night. I say to you, come. Come to, the, come to the Savior you see. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who seeks the lost sheep. Have you forgotten that? Are you the one of the 99 this morning? Christ is seeking you through the preaching of the word, you see. Did you forget that Christ restores the fallen saint? Brethren, if, if any man be overtaken in a fall, ye that are spiritual, is any more spiritual than Christ? Christ will restore you. Have you forgotten that Christ heals the brokenhearted? That wonderful passage there in Luke chapter 4. He has sent me to preach the gospel to the brokenhearted. Are you here this morning again under the burden of some sin? Oh, again, look to this one. Come to Christ again and afresh. Renew your love and renew your determination to live for his glory in this day. And so that's the first two. If you're here this morning having never come, come. If you're here this morning having failed, come to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning again and, and your soul is in that happy place where when you, if I were to talk to you, you would say, not by way of arrogance and not by way of boasting, but you would say, God has been so good. God has kept me through temptation and God has kept me in, in ways that I, I can't even believe. And, and there I was. I, things seemed to be set in such a tight spot, but Jesus Christ delivered me. To those of you who are here like that, let me say this then. It is to you and to me, to us, that we must protect and defend this gospel of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. This gospel must be protected. Why would we allow this gospel to be muddled up? Why would we allow this gospel to be exchanged for some cheap imitation? Why would we allow this gospel to be, to be abandoned for, for, for this generic religious talk? And so when it comes to defend this gospel, let me say to you three things, to myself three things. Number one, let us defend this gospel. Let us defend this gospel, again, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, with, with zeal. And let us, uh, so let us defend it. First of all, let us defend this gospel then doctrinally. Go back again to Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. Paul was defending this, this, this gospel doctrinally. If any preach a gospel other than that which I have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Do you know the gospel sufficiently to be able to untangle all of its counterfeits, to expose its counterfeits? That passage of scripture in Galatians 6, verses 11 through 14, gives you the, the ability to do that. False Christianity is mentioned there. True Christianity is, is, is asserted. So let's do it doctrinally. Let's defend the, this gospel. Let's defend it personally. And by that I mean this. Let's defend it from the perspective of having personally experienced it. You remember what Paul says again in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20? Christ, the Son of God, loved me and gave himself for me. Paul saw himself in the very middle of the whole plan of the gospel. And I hope you do as well. And so when you defend the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's not an academic exercise. It's not doing it so that you might pass a theology exam. It's because this is the gospel of your Savior. This is the gospel that saves your soul. So let us do it doctrinally. Let us do it personally. Per, uh, let us do it personally. But thirdly, let us also do it charitably. Let us understand that there are those times so long as we are affirming and keeping and defending and protecting the essence of the gospel, we can engage all men in all ways in order that we might win some. Let's do it charitably. Do you remember there in the book of Acts? Uh, Aquila and Priscilla, uh, they were there and they heard that eloquent man, uh, Apollos, uh, speaking. And he was, he, was, he was being used, but his, his message was off a little bit. And what did Aquila and Priscilla do? They went and they showed to him the way of God more, more perfectly. You see, they did it charitably. They didn't run him out of town. They didn't chase him out. And so when we come to 
to embrace this gospel, when we come to understand this gospel, when we come to, to believe this gospel, when we come to defend this gospel, let's make sure we can do it doctrinally. Let's do it from our own personal experience with it, and let's do it charitably as well. I never say this, but I hope I get an amen. I love the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> our Father and our God, be with us as your people, we pray. Help us to do those things that bring honor to your name. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.